Well, I want you to go to the book of Romans, chapter 13. Romans, does that sound familiar? I hope it does. Uh, we have been in the book of Romans a year, and then we uh, took a break. Christmas, uh, New Year, and then I did a couple of Sundays challenging you uh, about uh, our church for the New Year. And so now then I want to go back to the book of Romans and finish. We are in chapter 13. We are going to begin in verse number 8. Lord willing, do the last chapter. Let me just give you a quick review. Paul wrote this to the church at Rome, not the church of Rome today. This was a local New Testament congregation, uh, probably small, uh, made up uh, partly of Jewish believers uh, and predominantly of Gentile believers. At the point in their history, they did not have a Bible like we have today. By divine inspiration and the leadership of the Lord, the Apostle Paul wrote this book. This book of Romans is called the Charter of the Christian Church. All of the major doctrines of what we believe are in the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, particularly the doctrines of grace, salvation by faith in Christ, by the grace of God, by the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that was a doctrine that was very much under fire in Paul's day, and here we are 2,000 years later down the road, and that doctrine is still very much under fire. That salvation is all of God and none of man. It is a free gift. It is not earned, merited, or bought. A prideful man clearly has a problem with that. I'm glad we have this. Then, we took a break from that doctrinal section, Romans 9, 10, and 11. Uh, Paul addressed his own people, the Jewish people, and he talked about where they were in history and their future. Then, in chapter 12, Paul began by encouraging us to commit our lives to the Lord and serve Him and be faithful. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then this tough verse, which plays out in the rest of the book, and be not conformed to this world, but be renewed by the spirit of your mind, by the Word of God. Christian living is just not easy. It is when you're at home. It is while you're sitting here in church. But living the Christian life while you're out in the world can be tough. You have to have a thick skin sometimes because the only thing that most unbelievers will ever know about Christ or Christianity or the church is by watching your life. So it, it isn't just a preacher that lives in a glass house. We all do. And so verse chapter 12 through chapter 16 is application. Paul's method is always teach, 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 and then apply, apply, apply. Now, what we have done so far in chapter 12, chapter 12, uh, chapter 13 through verse number 7, we have looked at our responsibility to God, our responsibility to our neighbor, our responsibility to our church. And today, in my text, we're going to look at our responsibility to ourselves or personal 
behavior. Does it really matter if you're a Christian how you live in the world? The answer is absolutely. Be not conformed to the world is Romans 12. Is the foundation on which all of the application is built. So, I, I want us to go to verse number 8 of uh, Romans chapter 13. Verse 8 is the introduction to this section. Verse 14 is the application to this section. And in the middle is the sermon, the text, uh, personal behavior. So, verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now this verse is one of the primary verses used by men, preachers, and ministries who have a ministry of counseling people about their finances. This is their favorite verse. Oh, no man anything. That would be included. But it is only a fragment of what this really means. When it comes to finances, obviously, it's better to be out of debt. It's less stressful. It's less stressful uh, it makes living a little easier. Uh, oh, no man, anything uh, is a good principle to follow in every area of your life, including finances. And by the way, and this is not a sermon about money, but I, I want to just throw this out there while I'm at it. This is not a prohibition to buy something on credit. As long as there is a, an agreement, let's say you're going to buy a car. There's an agreement and you don't have the money. You have to borrow the money. There's an agreement between the bank and you. They're going to loan you so much money and you're going to pay them back so much each month. The Bible does not forbid that. As a matter of fact, the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, has a lot of advice on that. But it, it, it does not forbid buying on the credit. The problem with on the credit is, what if you lose your job? So it's still wise not to have any debts. But as long as you make that payment every month, you're not violating this verse. But this is a verse that covers the entire area of the Christian life. And to understand, oh no man, anything, you need to get the rest of the verse. But to love one another for is the reason why you don't want to owe and be a debt to anybody about anything. For he that loveth another has done what? Fulfill the law. The law says don't, 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 or do, 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 do. And in the Old Testament, the motivation was, you have to do it or else. In the New Testament, the motivation is, you do this because you love the Lord. Total different motivation. Amen. The gist of the verse is simply this. If I love you like I love me, if I love the Lord the way I'm supposed to, then I am not going to do anything to you to hurt you. I'm not going to do anything to you that I wouldn't want done to me. That's the principle. You love yourself, you love the Lord, you love others. That, my dear friends, is the only motivation in the world by which you can successfully live the Christian life. Yeah. Oh, no man anything but to love them, for he that 
loveth another, has fulfilled the law. So, when I love you like I love me, when I love you like I am supposed to, I will not do anything bad to you, and then I automatically have fulfilled the law. For this, now here's the human side of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, see how much more this, oh no man, anything that, uh, than it is just finances, any other commandment is briefly comprehended in this same name, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, you cannot do that without God. The fruit of the Spirit is love. What, what is asked of us here is not natural. Some people are very easy to love. Some people just absolutely grind you the wrong way. This takes divine help. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, Goodness, it takes God in your life. It takes the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. It takes you strengthening your spiritual life by Bible study and prayer and whatever means God puts at your feet to use. Verse 10, love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, Paul, what, what I just read you, verse 8, 9, 10, Paul says that to every church he writes to. So I, I want to take you to one more place. It's the same subject, but boy, is it elaborated on. I want you to turn to the next book, the book of Galatians, chapter number 5. Galatians, chapter number 5, beginning in verse 16. And going through verse 25. Now remember what I just said. You can't do this without the help of God. So here we go. Verse 16. Galatians 5. This I say that walk in the Spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. That's your Christian walk. The lusts of the flesh. That's the constant tug in everybody's life. To go the other way. Only the Holy Spirit can give victory over the body. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. I want to make a, a, a thought here. The modern translations have changed this word to should not. It doesn't, of course you should not. No, this is much stronger. You cannot. Without the help of God. No, you can't imagine. You know, I, I have to live this too. I'm not just preaching to y'all. I, I got to live this too. You can't imagine how many times on the public life I have to, have to wish to, to, to myself and say, Lord, help me to keep my big mouth shut. Mm -hmm. I'd rather just give them a piece of my mind. And Pat says, you can't afford it. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, you won't do these things. And now, boy, look at this list. Now, the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, Lust, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revel revelings, and such like. Now, Christian, I know this flies in the face of what's being preached today, but I want you to look at this very carefully. Of the which I, te I tell you before, and as I've told you, that they which do such 
things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Can I put that on the most common denominator? You can't live like the devil and go to heaven. Just can't do that. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. That's inside of you. Long-suffering, generous, goodness. That's toward others. Faith, meekness, temperance. That's toward God. Against such there is no law. In other words, this is what you need to do. And they that are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And folks, I'm going to be the last preacher to ever stand in a pulpit here or anywhere else and tell you that that's easy. Because it just isn't. I'll be 80 in a few months and I'm still fighting these battles. That won't stop till the coffin. If we live in the Spirit, we'll also walk in the Spirit. Now, let's go back to Romans 13. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, Paul applies it. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, the time is your present life. To wake out of sleep means you cannot be a lethargic, casual, easy going, read your Bible when you can, go to church when you can. You can't be a lethargic Christian and successfully fight the lusts of your own body. Well, why is it important that we live good Christian lives? For now our salvation is nearer than when we believe. Whether you've been a Christian a day, or whether you've been a Christian 50, 60, or 70, or however many years, you are closer now to heaven than you have ever been. Every morning you get up, you are one day closer to heaven. Get ready. Be ready. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. And folks, as we look at our world today, this was my Sunday school lesson. The night is life on earth. The day is far is at hand, are the days of your life that are gone. Most of us, assuming we live a full life, are a lot closer to heaven than we've ever been. And by the way, that's a good thing. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. That's the list I just read to you out of Galatians 5. Let us put on the armor of light. Light is everything that is Christ-like, Bible-like, good, right, decent. And by the way, notice the word armor. I want to say it again. There's nothing easy about this. You can't do it without God. But with God, what's the armor? Your faith, your prayer life, your Bible reading, your church life, your good friends, staying away from evil, doing good. Armor, the Christian life is a fight. It is a battle. It is walking in the armor of life. And the admonition is let's walk honestly as in the day. Here you have it. Let us walk honestly in the day. Let me repeat to you what I've already said. This really is saying the only thing most unbelievers will ever know about Christianity, they will learn from your life. Mm -hmm. Not in drunkenness, people, our beloved country is drowning in an ocean of alcohol. Not in chambering, excess, evil party, wantonness, 
sexual lust, not in strife and envying. By the way, I, I seriously doubt that I'm talking to a congregation that has any problem with drunkenness or chambering and wantonness. But I want you to know in that horrible, awful list are two more words that we could be guilty of if we're not careful. Strife and envying. Mm -hmm. Not getting along with people, lusting what other people have, lusting after stuff you don't have, is in the same verse as those horrible things. Uh, just something to think about, okay? Just something to think about. And now the conclusion. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's positive and a negative. Put, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a metaphoric term, like I put my coat on. Put on. It's like something that, now, I get out of this monkey suit as soon as I get home, but during the week, whatever I put on in the morning, after I get back from the gym, that I wear all day. The symbolism is put on Christ and have him with you all day so you won't do that. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a one-sentence explanation of the word sanctification. Growing in Christ-likeness. And then there's this command, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And again, I must say, you can't do that without God. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Whatever your fleshly temptations are, don't feed them. If you're given to alcohol, don't go to a bar. Guys, if you're lustful like the beautiful women, they're all over TV. Turn the channel. Turn it off. Throw a brick through it if you have to. Don't do that. Your wife will kill you. <laughs> May not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The sermon in a nutshell is simply this. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look, folks. We're living in an anti-Christian society now. Yes. People don't want to hear about God. They don't want to, they don't want to read the Bible. They don't want to pray. They want to get all of that out of our national life. It is super important that Christians live like Christians because we're light and we're salt and you and your Christian life may be the only thing that some people will ever see to teach them about Christ and salvation mm -hmm. and God. It's always been important that Christians live right, but it has become a million times more important in the times in which we live. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please? With every head bowed and every eye closed, this obviously was a message to Christians to encourage you, to challenge you, be everything the Lord wants you to be and, and you're the first that's going to be blessed by God if you follow the principles of godly living as laid out in the Bible. And who only knows who else will be blessed if you'll follow these biblical guidelines. If you're not saved, if you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to talk to us. You need to reach out.
But as we face a new year, it's so important. It's so important. May this message be a blessing, an encouragement, and a challenge in your life. Our precious Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the instructions of your word. Thank you for the good people who are in this house this morning to worship you <coughs> and to be taught the Bible. May your blessing be on this group. May your grace, your mercy, your peace, your love and care lead them every step of every day of this week. And may you be glorified. That's why you made us. You made us for you. You made us to glorify you. I pray that will happen in each individual life here and in this church as a group. I pray, I ask, I seek these things in the name and power of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray and ask this. Amen. Number? 124. Number 124.